It is my pleasure to welcome Bill Shanninger here. Bill is one of the co-authors of this fantastic new book, Power to the Middle, Why Managers Hold the Key to the Future of Work. That's actually one of my favorite titles in a long time. So it's kind of revolutionary in, in, in nature. Power to the Middle. Bill, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. It is it is absolutely a pleasure. So your co-authors, let's not leave them out. Brian Hancock, Emily Field, the three of you. Why this book now at this point in time? Well, you know, if you were to look at it from a historical standpoint, it's about 25 years since War for Talent was published. Okay. And so, you know, that was what, 98, I guess, around there, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, I was coming towards the end of my McKinsey career. And I, you know, I'd started our people analytics practice, ran global talent, and I just felt like we'd learned a lot and it would be nice to revisit what we knew. You know, we were running things like talent leader forums. Brian and I had started McKinsey Talks Talent and the reception to McKinsey Talks Talent was pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. And I've often found myself ranting about the plight <laughs> of middle managers. And it just felt like there was enough there that we could talk about it just as an idea. Have we gotten it wrong in the middle? Particularly as we'd started getting a hint that we were going to talk ourselves into a recession and go through another round of cost cuts. Right, right. So that was, so it just felt like, okay, we knew that there was a thing. But when we started just early days of problem solving, we were looking at how we'd been thinking about future work, the topic in work, workforce, and workplace. Mm -hmm. You know, what work has changed? Like, who'd have guessed that we'd go to big box retail stores and never go in the store? Right. You know, as an example. And so, well, what work has changed permanently? And what was kind of because we couldn't stand next to each other? All right. Well, <laughs> I mean, the person running the place probably has a good handle on that. You know, what what have the workers learned? What skills still really matter? What has to come and what don't matter anymore? Well, the person they work for should know that. Yeah. Right. And then, hey, we have this issue where, you know, yes, a lot of the workforce has always had to go to work, but a significant and notable portion of the workforce is saying, I don't want to come back to the office. I've been doing it for two years. I want to do it out here. Well, who's central to create an environment that people want to join and stay at? The person they work for. So when we got to that and said, hey, the answer is the same. In the same problem solving, there was like someone sitting in the corner going, yeah, but you know, everybody hates middle managers. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> gosh. Right? I mean, let's let's think about the plight of the poor middle manager for oh, the yeah. last 30 or so years. Yeah. I mean, and, and some unnamed large consulting firms have often suggested that that's where we take costs out of our, our structures. Um, just as an aside for, for everybody out there, I, I spend probably 600 hours a year in coaching sessions or workshop programs with this, this particular audience. They're some of the most stressed out, um, you know, over, uh, overworked, uh, under-resourced, uh, under-respected, disrespected individuals in our, in our workplace. And then if you juxtapose that, Bill, and I'm sure you've seen these numbers, uh, you know, at Gallup, our good friends at Gallup over there suggest that, hey, look, two thirds of us are disengaged and 70% of that disengagement is as a function of the manager. We're clearly getting this wrong. Tim Harder does some nice work at Gallup. He's really, <laughs> he's really Absolutely. good. Yeah. Um, you know, I feel like we made it mission impossible for these folks for a variety of reasons. I mean, one, Let's, so I'm 53, so that puts me firmly in Gen X. And, you know, there's a lot of people in the window, let's say 35 to 60, somewhere sure, in there. Sure, sure. Well, many of them will have seen the end of cradle to grave employment. Mm -hmm. They'll have seen, you know, wonderful American institutions go away. I mean, I live in, in Bethlehem, PA. Bethlehem mm -hmm. Steel went cold. Right. Mack trucks moved away. My friends whose parents worked at Lucent thought they were millionaires and found out they were not. You know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um. So for those of us, we saw, well, hey, hold on a minute. Just going and working at some place for a long time and staying there and being loyal isn't enough. And then, you know, it just it just for the brief history moment, because I think it's interesting, in our in the late in the late 80s, Wall Street, Gordon Gecko was intended to be a villain. <laughs> right. And he was celebrated. I think it was like he became I, I, a hero of sorts. Yeah. He became a hero. Yeah. With greed is good. Hat. Yeah. Greed is good. Like yeah. really resonated, right? And there was almost right. this, you know, winner at all cost kind of orientation for companies. And then we ran right into, you know, re-engineering, right? Then we ran in uh, this, the run up to the Y2K stuff, the dot com stuff, the fixation, war for talent, real fixation on a talent only, mm -hmm. even though just as a sheer product of numbers. That central box, even if you follow the nine of uh, the three by three, you know, the nine box. Yeah. That's, you know, 45% of the of the place. And so there was just this run up, you know, through Y2K, 
then the run up to the financial crisis, where we've had things happen to this group, a fixation on spans and layers. And with all due respect to my, you know, former competitors, six by six is nonsense. <laughs> right. It makes, you know, just think about like a really good general counsel who happens to be really good at say like IP law. Well, they're probably still going to carry a little bit of a caseload. Sure. They shouldn't have a huge span of control. Right. You know, and so there's this idea of, well, what if the people you work with are all kind of artisanal? Then you need a smaller span because it's each person requires different bandwidth. But if you're running a, you know, a call center somewhere where everybody has about the same level of education and skills, maybe you can go really big. My beef with this is we tried to narrowly fit them into something that could be driven by a laptop and a business analyst mm -hmm. okay. and didn't well said, really well think said. through didn't really work. think through what no, it doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. So these people have been banged up. And then you run into the last part, likely, which is they're called manager because the hay point system wouldn't allow them to be paid more. <laughs> I know I'm only, yeah, right. You know what I mean? But like it's yeah. accumulation of people and you pack some things in there that you come in this box. But in many cases, there are people who would have been perfectly happy being a really good individual contributor. Mm -hmm. So that, that run up has much like, you know, uh, the Gallup folks were saying, we have a lot of people who work for bosses who aren't particularly engaged, who feel overwhelmed, who feel like they have to manage, you know, administrivia and bureaucracy. I mean, when we ask them what I think, what did we ask about 800 or something, 850? Right. The vast majority of them are saying, I don't have nearly enough time on talent. I'm overburdened with bureaucracy. And by the way, I don't think the people who pay me care. Yeah. I mean, there a lot of them are doing a good portion of their time with individual contributor type roles, even though they're supposed to manage. And 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 frankly, I take issue some, some of the root cause. We don't select well for managers. No. And we absolutely don't develop and coach. And, you know, as much as I offer training courses, uh, uh, training, it doesn't make a manager. It, it's a sustained learning and development experience. And we haven't, haven't appreciated that at all. So, so let, let me ask oh, you. It's an easy, also an easy target for cost cutting. Oh, you know, if oh, you think so about easy. learning and development, so right. I mean, I wondered, you know, and, and if you remember the time at which we really started getting good at working capital from mm -hmm. a financial standpoint, I feel like some of those same principles have been applied to human capital. We very rarely run with a full complement. You almost never have excess of a full complement. Someone taking vacation causes guilt for them. We don't really invest in the go away kind of training experience. We don't really send people out on sabbatical much anymore. I mean, I, all the things that you would have done to have a full and hearty cadre of leaders kind of gone. So everyone's always limping. I mean, well, that was the interesting thing about when, working through COVID when people mm -hmm. were down to like 70, 75% compliment. And then they decided to reset the baseline and go, well, I guess that's it. <laughs> Listen, you can run a refinery on a shoestring, on a shoestring number of people to safely run the refinery. Right. But it's right. going to break pretty soon. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, it's those sorts of things, right? I, th I think we've gotten it wrong. I, I always uh, channel my inner Deming on these types of things. The most important numbers in business are unknown and unknowable. Eviscerating that mid-level there just to cut cost and uh, and what have you. The ripple effects, the implications to our organizations, to quality, to customer service, to engagement, to retention, to career development, to leadership development, all of them are profound. And we don't think about that, or at least historically. All right, so let me ask you the question: What are senior leaders getting wrong? That's you know kind of the first half about management, and the second half is what is it going to take to get them to recognize the importance of giving power to the middle? Well, they probably should have picked up on that a little bit already. I mean, the run you referenced Gallup earlier, yeah, you know, the two decades worth of research that my colleagues and I had worked on regarding organizational health. You know, we're able to show the link between how you run the place and how much money you make. It's incontrovertible, right? You can and you can break that down to the importance. Yet, of, are you of, seeing the, the flow through? Are you seeing the flow through in positive actions? The Gallup numbers haven't budged in decades. Um, you know, well, Gallup. It, it, it's also a method function of being twelve okay. questions. It okay. becomes almost performative on an annual basis, and the the business model there is actions for individual coaches, much like what you do. You know, yeah. down yeah, to right, right. down the leader. If you take it up to the org level, you'll you'll start seeing you know a bit of an arc where maybe a little bit more bimodal. Honestly, mm -hmm. the ones that get it and get valuing how mm -hmm. you run the place and want it run like this is the way we run it. Mm -hmm. Those that have a reasonably homogenous way of running the place do way better mm -hmm. than Thousand Flowers Blooming. Like the cult of personality, another artifact of the '90s, the iconic CEO, and you know allowing each plant or department manager to run it in their own way, <laughs> devastating to organizational health because you lose all of your scale. If mm -hmm. you run it kind of the same way, then you can reasonably plug and play. 
But if everywhere you go is a new risk, probably not. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so maybe one thing is they're not very clear on how it is they want to run the place. The companies aren't. You know, they allow a lot of individual leaders right. choice. Right. And then they don't particularly train them. So it's be- more of a second and third order derivative of what leaders you experienced early in your career. Mm-hmm. And maybe most damning, we don't seem to select on actually being able to lead. Not at all. We seem to they- select a whole lot more on where you're a good individual contributor. Yeah. I still find, and again, my experience is limited. I'm not a big consulting firm. I'm a a solopreneur. But the number one method of identifying managers and developing them is sink or swim. Hey, you're a good contributor. Let's put you into this role. And then, by the way, uh, yeah, yeah, good luck. And they don't say that. They make noise about wanting to do the things. But contextually and challenging, you know, Linda Hill's perspective, there is no more significant change you will encounter in your career than moving from contributor to manager. We better select them right, and then we better develop them right. For sure, no, for sure, and I, I just, it just, you know, there was a period through the teens where, in particular, we started seeing, hey, look at all this stuff. We're going to call it self-paced. Mm-hmm. Self-paced also means not in cadres, not in cohorts, and avoiding a large bill of getting people together. <laughs> I mean, you know, the part of the part of learning and development, a huge portion of it was creating a sense of we. Mm-hmm. we have a responsibility to lead this place a certain way. Mm-hmm. Oh, I can learn from my colleagues. I'm not weak by saying, hey, what do you think about this? Mm-hmm. So much of that had been eviscerated. And then even when when COVID hit and nobody was traveling, it just looked like slim slim and easy pickings for, well, we're not going to have a travel budget right. for learning anymore. <laughs> and then we wonder, we wonder why we have people who will take jobs and don't show up, who will take a job and say, yeah, but you know, I have no, two thirds of them are saying, yeah, I'll quit. I mean, the great attrition, great attraction stuff, was so profound that it wasn't just frontline employees. It was through the place. Sure. sure. And all of them saying, if this doesn't work for me, it's just not going to work. And singularly, the importance of the middle manager, you know, stacked because they're Mm -hmm. middle, they're managers and managers. Devastating. If we don't, if we don't fundamentally, I think we don't repair the fabric of what it means to be an employee Mm -hmm. of an institution. We will likely just continue careening towards a dressed up version of the gig economy. Ooh. Ooh, that's a profound thought. That, that could be your next book there. I like that. That's pretty provocative. <laughs> so, all right, we're sitting around a uh, room of uh, senior executives, and they're at least enlightened enough to want to hear from you and your co-authors about giving power to the middle. What is it that you're advising them to do? How do they go from, hey, that concept resonates, I get it, to how do I bring it to life? You know, one of the easiest things to do is just look at the job itself mm-hmm. and, and say, you know, if first, most roles held by an incumbent are not the role that you hired the person for. It's the role you hired them for, plus all the other crap you added on. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. Right. It's excess all the capacity. stuff that keeps rolling downhill day after day. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So one is just, what if you just went back to the basics? What the, is the role actually responsible for in terms of value creation or risk mitigation? Mm-hmm. and start there. That's probably a relatively small list. Then look at all the standing meetings, all the bu- bureaucratic forms, all the self-serve push to managers. I mean, a very interesting thing done by functions was that at some point they were losing the game to finance, getting hammered on benchmarks. Mm-hmm. Said, well, okay, we're not going to do it anymore. We're going to push that out. Who are we going to push it to? We're going to push it to the manager. Well, if they're doing that, one, are they even qualified to do it? And two, what aren't they doing while they're doing that? And that yeah, to me, that, that that calculus, the trade-off was never reconciled. So it's one cool. job, get mm-hmm. it to the essence, right? And then good role clarity should be, what does good look like? By when? With whom? What can you decide on your own? And what do you have to come back to me for? If each successive nested layer of leadership just got great at practicing role clarity, mm-hmm. Then you'd have people working on things that like it was obvious how it fit in, how it mattered, who they had to work with, you know, that sort of stuff. Right. I mean, some of this is basics, you know, I I, I so love that. So I've uh, you know, I I develop frameworks because it's what I do. And uh, the manager's operating system is one of my frameworks. Number one uh, uh, program is role clarity on the operating system. So, yeah, uh, yeah, this this is just a, a challenging scenario. I'm thinking about. One middle manager in particular called me up the other day. He said, Art, I have 15 projects. I have two people who work for me. We can handle about three of these things. Management is 
just absolutely frantic top management because the numbers aren't there. Uh, supply chain is still screwed up uh, and so forth and so on. I have no idea how to navigate this. How do we coach and counsel those managers sitting in the middle, getting hammered from below or above, and then also getting the stresses from the, from those below them? You know, it's interesting. I think one of the things that creates real stress is a sense of, uh, I don't have any agency in this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. You know, I'm getting whipsawed. You know, I have mm-hmm. I have workers in varying degrees of, you know, are telling me how everything is wrong, how I'm a terrible boss, mm-hmm. how they want to bring their dog to work, you know, through to, <laughs> you know, bosses, bosses yeah. who seemingly have lost sight with what the actual, you know, gearing effect is right. of labor. Right. You know, and so, uh, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe one of the most important things to do is actually then after real clarity, go and look at the volume of work. Mm hmm actual volume how standard it is i mean just think about something like like fp and a in the finance function do you have one pull of data or multiple do you have one form or multiple do you allow people to do their own version of the books just from an accounting standpoint that's kind of stupid but Mm -hmm. you know everybody wants their own forms when we look at how many things that we allow leaders to blindly ask for something Mm non-standard no price tag and it's just somebody else's problem right Right. And so that, but that trickles down all the way down. It trickle, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's the trickle down or rolls down and uh, it hits these people yeah. right in the middle. And then they're left wondering what hit For them sure. how to navigate it. For sure. You and know, old, cl- <laughs> I'm sorry. Just one, I was just thinking, yeah. you know, old classic top teamwork. If you used to be able to look at a calendar and say, okay, when do you report to the street? If you're a public company, right. got it. Okay. The board meetings just back behind that. Cause they'll approve it. Okay. When's the seasonality of the board? Got it. Mm-hmm. What does that mean for the work of the senior most executives? Got it. Now it goes down into the shoots in the work. The angle of that, if you were to put it on a calendar, that latency shows you how much rework you build into the system just so people can like tinker with PowerPoint decks. So right. You know, it's that, that idea is is the machine crafted to just use people up in the middle and not actually do the work, but to produce PowerPoint decks for the senior executives, the board, Ooh. and the street. I think in a lot of cases it is. I, I, I think so. Uh, yeah. and, and to some extent, it, it's optimized to do that. Yet the cost of that optimization is the morale and the the creativity and the innovation of yeah. all of those in the middle and those doing the work. Well, it's so easy to count heads, yeah, as opposed and take heads out as opposed to counting work mm-hmm. and units of work. You know, so I've one one client, uh, unnamed unnamed firm, director of cloud security for a big financial institution, and we had the dialogue yesterday. He's again the classic example of this mid level manager and doing some remarkable things in a world where there's some bad actors that really want to break through their defenses. Um, can't get the headcount. It was approved one level above, two levels above, sat on the CEO's desk and can't get approved. And my gentle nudge, having grown up in big companies, is there's always room. There's always money. How persuasive are you? How effective are you? How well networked are you? How how well are you able to, to cultivate and draw upon your influence there? But having to go to extraordinary lengths to get that type of support to do his job, to protect the company, seems ridiculous. Well, I mean, um, it's it's... It's an asymmetric loading of risk. Yeah, yeah. You know, if it goes badly, it's his fault. Yeah, you know. Yep. It, it is. There is a cowardice in many organizations, particularly in places where you can't necessarily say yes, but you can certainly say no. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And I, I think I, I think we've done the, the, you know the farther more in the middle we get, where people mm-hmm. where work actually gets done. If you think about the people who work for the CEO, that's often just it's executive leverage, and it's you need it. Right, mm-hmm. but more of executive leverage. Three and four levels down, you really do start getting to people where there's like, you know, the classic 06 colonel, right? Who's like <laughs> running a base or something. Right. That is actual uh, highest levels of on the ground leadership and then running through. I think we've we've made these roles where they're there to look up and feed the beast, mm-hmm. not look not looking down, you yeah. know, and how it's actually going. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, well said. So, I suppose the, ch- the challenge becomes, where do we move from here? I am curious how, y- you know, you and uh, and Brian and Emily, what you're, what you're hearing and what you're saying to the audience that's responding to your book. So first, what are you hearing about this book? Well, sometimes it's uh, hallelujah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank I'm, you I'm a cheerleader. Writing. I'm a cheerleader for thank it. You for, thank you for writing one. Yeah. Um, sometimes, you know, just the, the idea, and we, you know, we wrote this early in the intro, recognizing the irony of, you know, three, in my case, formerly of McKinsey, in their case, right, still, you right. know, all of us, senior partner and partners at McKinsey, 
the irony of that. But I think, you know, if you buy into the idea that we know that healthy organizations just outperform up for all stakeholders, mm-hmm. right, then shouldn't we make it healthier? Mm-hmm. And if you want to run the place better, make it healthier. Well, that is right in the lap of that mm-hmm. broad swath in the middle who are translating, you know, strategy into daily action, who are sense making from company purpose to individual purpose, who are selecting, mm-hmm. who are coaching and giving feedback, not about the annual form mm-hmm. in performance appraisal, but actual coaching. Mm-hmm. Right. That's the kind of stuff why it's so central. So when you think about where to go from here, a good portion of it is what's back to the essence of leadership. Yeah. Right. And can you help? You know, people if left to their own devices would do what they want to do. Mm-hmm. If you think about the art form of getting people to do what you want them to do, it's, <laughs> it's hard. Right. I love, it's hard. I love I love this call to get back to role clarity, to get back to the the essence of leadership and to some of the fundamentals. We've we've so lost that. All right. So here's a radical idea. And I come up with a lot of dumb ideas, but every once in a while one lands. Um Big fan of Gary Hamill, management must be reinvented, the practice of management. Taking that uh, drilling down, I think the role of manager must be reinvented for a new world where everything is changing. And I know this sounds ridiculous, and I want it to sound ridiculous. I think we throw out the name. We change the label. And I'm really lousy at labeling, but let's call him a coacher or a teacher or something other than a, you know, uh, industrial revolution era manager, because there's a lot that comes through all of that negative connotation. All right. Your opportunity to uh, to highlight the uh, ridiculousness of that idea. Well, I'm not sure it's ridiculous. I mean, you know, the organizational health index, we wrote that in 2002. Is that no ordinary performance? Oh, well, listen, I wanted to just call it culture, call uh-huh. it what it was, uh-huh. how you run the place. Yeah. And then at one point we tried calling it organizational performance. That didn't really stick because there was only one performance people really wanted to get. And we ended up on organizational health. Mm-hmm. Now that was, that would help by, you know, our, our former managing director, Ian Davis, writing in the FTE. And mm-hmm. actually I think Al Gore did as well. My <laughs> point is lexicon matters strangely. It does. Right. Yeah. I mean, there are times, I mean, I, I, I've been in so many meetings in the last two years to be like, that innovation is a trigger word. You mean get better? <laughs> get better is a trigger word for you? Yeah. Is that what we're talking about? You know, it's like, it's simply the agile stuff. Mm-hmm. If you were to say agile, okay, so you mean there's stuff you can count on and there's stuff that you can react to really quickly. Is that what you mean? Mm-hmm. Yes. All right. But it's enterprise agility. Ooh. Well, is that what, is that what you mean? You mean, <laughs> you mean change the structure, change the operating model, change how everyone, the lexicon of what everyone's called. Mm-hmm. And so this, I'm only saying it because we can make things so complex. Mm-hmm. When I think simple things like imagine for a second, if you're paying, do you have kids? Did you I send do. them to like, okay. Yeah. Think about piano lessons, violin lessons, Done and, yep. and Not like, you know, and like seven-year-old soccer. <laughs> which, Done that. Okay. Right. Now all these things where the parents are footing the bill for something. Mm-hmm. They send the kid to practice, and then ostensibly there's some kind of performative experience. Mm-hmm. Would you ever have done it if the person you were sending them to didn't talk to your kid, yeah, didn't okay. coach them, didn't provide instruction? We are almost systemically making it so that the only people the managers really get to talk to are the most most I- inveterate bad performers. <laughs> well right? So, said. right? And so some of this is just... How about, I mean, so yeah, you can call it, you can call it leader, you can call it coach, you can call it team lead. I mean, I long, long ago when I was at this residential psychiatric treatment center, I was at first called treatment team leader, then treatment team supervisor. And I remember the the, the people who were, were above me, the people who hired me, thinking it was, uh, it's, it's a profound difference. You know, I got to tell you, I still got like 22 patients. Yeah. still got yeah. like eight staff. I'm still working like 60 hours a week. I'm pretty sure it's the same. Same thing. Yep, yep. <laughs> so I think some of this is the the extent to which we allow the lexicon game mm-hmm. to become important. We just further reinforce the real work that you, the leader, are asked to do every day mm-hmm. doesn't matter to us. Mm-hmm. You know, and well, I, I, I think it's a reinforcement, right? It's not why you're producing PowerPoint text as opposed yep. to having a conversation. So a little hyper jump here. Obviously, technology, artificial intelligence, things are changing. The role of the manager will change. I, I know that there's that, at least that one firm out there that likes to, with an 80% probability, highlight a 60% probability of something happening, which by a 40% probability, they'll be completely wrong. But I, I don't know if you followed that math there. Um, yeah. <laughs> How is technology going to affect the entire premise of this? Will there be a mid-level layer of manager, or is that going to be rendered obsolete? 
That's by the way, I want to commend you for your anchor man math. <laughs> Black Panther. Um <laughs> God, Paul Rudd is good. Um, you know, I just don't know how we do it without them. I really don't. I mean, mm-hmm. if the natural condition is people want to organize themselves. One, we like to be part of something. Mm-hmm. We like being part of something bigger. And often we will look towards someone to provide some coherence, mm-hmm. some shared sense of where we're going. Full democratic work very rarely works. Very rarely um, it's not that it's not that democracy is bad. I don't mean that, but I mean like full, like, oh, do we need a consensus? Mm-hmm. Oh, do we have to take a vote? With limited financial capital and limited human capital and a lot of risk, that's a pretty inefficient way of doing things. It's much better to group together and say, why does this thing exist? Purpose. How does this thing have impact or make money? Strategy. How do we run the place? Culture. Okay, got it. That's who we mm-hmm. are. How do we best organize ourselves to get some kind of of uh, an economy, economy of skill, skill, or scope, draw the boxes, structure. How do those boxes work together to make decisions get worked on? Op model. Okay, great. What big skills do we need? Mm-hmm. Okay, that in, in, enterprise capabilities. Got it. What leader, given those questions, is best suited to it? If we actually tuned the beast just a little bit to say it has to be consistent with our purpose and how we say we're going to behave okay. and how we want to run the place, you start narrowing down in towards a actually a relatively smaller set are well suited to what we're doing. And I only belabor that because I think, you know, when you give it a white space or some weird distilled version of what happened yesterday, you're just guaranteed to be a bad version of yesterday, mm-hmm. not actually looking where you're going. And so I, I don't know how large groups of people un or under led ever get to where you need them to go in without leadership. Ooh. Love, love the logic. Love the logic. You're a uh, blog post in every sentence and a book in uh, every, okay. uh, every, every, uh, th- thread here so <laughs> i've been i've been trained really well we have a, we have a producer uh, uh, the, well the woman who leads um publishing for mckinsey lucia raleigh uh-huh. she's been our host of mckinsey talks talent forever and i am well trained to think in um like for instance on all the blog on all the on all the pods and like if i don't get the top yeah like, god damn it what happened <laughs> <laughs> so i'm trained i'm trained in, 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 cut, in cut points so hey with all your background context experience what did you learn in your role in creating this book what did you learn? You know, a, a lot. I mean, it was. I So I, I retired May 31st. Congratulations. Thank you. It's 22 years and 10 months, nearly 23 years. Mm-hmm. Um, it was remarkable. I mean, I was going to be an academic, right? I mean, I was, I was, in fact, I was just trading notes with Dave Ulrich yesterday. Name drop, Dave. There you go for you. <laughs> and um, laughing about how, like, I, I was out at. I was at the Boston Academy of Management meeting in 99 looking for a job. Mm-hmm. And I thought I was going to go work at St. Joe's, which would have brought me close to home. I was at Auburn at the time. And uh, McKinsey just happened to come up. And I thought, okay, well, this might be fun. It's like, you know, I can do two years on somebody else's dime in London and I'll high tell it back to academics. But when, what I learned was there was stuff that I really learned in grad school, master's and PhD, that to this day, it's just still really good science. Mm-hmm. Right. Like we have like 70 years of good, mostly German psychologists <laughs> who've really who've really helped us think about right. psychology, social psychology, right? Or behavior, management, you know, behavioral economics. Um, there is a world of science out there that we seem increasingly willing to just ignore. Mm. Mm-hmm. I mean, our 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 make it up factor, if I if I look at you asking what we learned from when I joined in August of 2000 till now, the wing it and make it up factor has increased exponentially in our business. And now as we're seeing in academics, apparently some in academics. Oh, yes. Yeah. Some yeah, recent, which is, which recent is emerging scandals, right? Yeah. I'll tell you, when we're already fighting the battle of science, science matters. It's not helpful when the scientists are mm-hmm. uh, cooking the books, right? But so what did I learn? I learned one, there's still, most things can still be distilled to some the essence of how humans behave and think mm-hmm. and how humans behave around other humans in pursuit of work. Right, you know, psych, social psych, OB. Right, right. But the the run that we've been on in the last twenty years, hyper digital, hyper individualized, and the part of the workforce that's my child's age. I mean, Will, Will my son is twenty four. He's joining a professional mm-hmm. services firm here, you know, in September. They were raised with helicopter parenting. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, every emotion was valid. The parents went and talked to the principal and talked to the teacher or talked to the coach on their behalf. They set up play dates on their behalf. So we've created a, a portion of the workforce 
that is dramatically more demanding than we've had. By the way, I don't say what they're asking for is wrong. In many mm-hmm. cases, if you write down what they're asking for and what Gen Xers wanted, they're yeah. really similar. similar. We, just put right. Out, right. we just put out that thing about the generational differences aren't that great. They're not. Yeah. The big difference is, though, they talk about it a whole hell of a lot more. You I know, think there's the, even the, alignment the, with some of the boomer needs and those types of things. I, I think it's yes. a surprising alignment, no doubt. Yeah. About well, it. sometimes yeah. people don't want to be people don't want to work for a jerk. Yeah. They want to work on things. <laughs> Imagine that. that. Imagine so, that. You know, the whole arc of you're saying, well, OK, Bill, get to the point. How does that matter? But when I try to take it in its totality, right at the time when we need managers the most mm-hmm. because of COVID, because of the hyper individualization, you know, the digital first, you go to a room full of people sitting next to each other and they're on their phones, right? Yep. Right at the moment when we need them the most, they're the least prepared or the most burned they're out there. or the most they're depressed and they're, they're not there. And it's not because these are, these are cruel people or people who want to get up and say, I'm going to suck a little bit more today. Of course not. <laughs> we just have... We've grown, we haven't grown them that way, and we beat them down to where they're just trying to survive. Mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, those retiring now, massively unprepared. Ooh. So they might have to they might have to stick it out a few more years. A few more I'm years, no bad. doubt about it. I'm being yeah. bad. So yeah. all of that, all of that, all of that goes okay. So that's not a great scenario. Like mm-hmm. all right, but there's some things you can do. And then you come around again with you know, God forbid, tech has a round of right sizing to mm-hmm. so where it's like the sky is falling for the rest of us. Like, hey, you've been on a 20-year run of unbridled growth. It's okay to pause and resize the workforce. <laughs> but, you know, that I mean, that sort of stuff. And, oh, well, layoffs must be coming. Yeah, in pockets, in mm-hmm. places where they really you know, they really went hyper-growth in the beginning of COVID. Sure. But I do think a notable, the, the, the noise, if you will, coming from tech around, we don't need any middle managers. I beg to disagree. Unless you yourself are like a coder mm-hmm. or some artisanal creative type. And you really don't want to be interacted with, with anyone else. Okay. But you know what that really means? You want to play with other people's capital mm-hmm. and you don't want any accountability. Sorry. That's the gig economy. Yep. Okay. That, and if you like that, there's, there's plenty of platforms you can go on. If you're going to so, play with so, someone else's capital and people, you have rules and you have responsibilities. So well said. So kind of parting thought here. Um, someone's going to pick this book up and spend three or four hours or five hours with you, Brian and Emily. What, what are your, uh, what, what are your words of encouragement? Uh, what do you want them to be thinking yeah. about as they turn the page? Well, the first is if you like audiobooks, it's my voice. <laughs> oh, I narr- nice. I, You've got a good voice. I, narr- for that. I narrated <laughs> it. It's like, it's nearly six hours and I guarantee you will get wonderful evenings of sleep. No problem. <laughs> um, you good. know, my hope, I spent so long in like management science, whether it's mm-hmm. like, you know, getting, you know, getting the two masters and the PhD sure. or working at McKinsey. I feel like, boy, we need to do better. I mean, the condition of work for so many people just isn't good enough. Mm-hmm. Whether it's, you know, Jim Harder and the guys at Gallup talking about engagement, the number, the most important relationship you have in your life outside of your, your, your blood family is your boss. Right. I mean, you know, the relationship between problems at work and anxiety, depression, Drug, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, it's all work-related. At what point do we get to draw a line in the sand and say, we spend more of our waking hours here than anywhere, it just needs to be better? And our role in being better is if we lead people, I mean, literally, it's the Uncle Ben comment, right? It's like, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. The difference is the power mm-hmm. is not formal authority. The power is influence. Ooh. Power is creating. I love that contagion, statement. Right? That's the mm-hmm. thing. Right. Um, and I just, boy, we've so beat these people up. We might need a round of healing, honestly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Bill, what a, what a great place to uh, to leave off. Uh, thank you again. Thanks to uh, Brian and Emily for uh, fantastic research. Well, they did all the hard work. Okay, really, <laughs> it was just, they allowed me to tag hey, along. Kudos to you for uh, doing the audio narration, and this was really fascinating. Wishing you the best of success. Excited to have spent this time with you. Hey, thanks thank you. so thank you so much.